Hold it here. Right. So, okay. hi everyone. Uh, my name's Sean, and uh, my name's Kieran, uh, and we're going to be talking about stuff and things today. About stuff. So we need to apologise uh, before we start. Um, I was at the pub last night, and I completely forgot that we had to write a presentation for today. Uh, and one thing led to another, and I had at least seven pints, and this was written by me and Kieran. Uh, whilst I was very drunk. Yeah, so it's essentially a new talk to us as well. We've not seen it. So <laughs> this, should, this should be a wonderful, wonderful experience. Right, so um, who are we? Uh, Sean Oxby and Karen Hicks, we've already been through that. Um, we both studied at Lincoln University. Uh, we both did games computing. Uh, so you did games production and I did games computing. Uh, and then we decided after university to found a company. So we founded this company called Hitpoint Games. Uh, and then we made a game called Hashtag Dungeon. Uh, and Hashtag Dungeon is a game that uses Twitter to generate all this content. Do you want to take it over, Kieran? Yeah. Right, so how am I going to hold this? Yeah, hold that. Hello. Right, so, um, yeah, we made Hashtag Dungeon. Um, so it's an action roguelike that, as Sean just mentioned, uses Twitter to do all of the generation. Um, can you press the Yep. And the next one, we don't. That's just a nice picture of the Halloween update we did. <laughs> so, I get a phone call from Sean, and he's like, can we use uh, Twitter to make like a roguelike? And foolishly, I went, sure, why not? What's the worst that can happen? It was a big mistake. Ha How can you use Twitter to make, gen like, to make content generation? Well, so first, the most obvious answer is to take the strings from a tweet and make something. Um, we messed about this for a while. Nothing interesting came out of it. We weren't making use of Twitter, really. It was just, we might as well put in a random string uh, the dungeons that were being created were boring. We could so. have done so much better, so we decided let's try something else. So, let's actually pass the different strings and tweets and try and pick words out to, you know, make interesting stuff. So, if the, like, uh, tweet had ice in, it'd be an ice room. Uh, celebrate would maybe equal treasure, stuff like that. Um, and then on the other side, like, warm would be for fire traps. Um, again, this was kind of boring. Uh, it didn't really go anywhere. Even though like an Oprah Winfrey enemy would be kind of cool, and it would sort of like roll over and kill you, um, we decided against that we thought something could be better. I mean, we thought Twitter is a great place for collaboration and talking and discussing things, so why not change it so the game is designed around collaboration and changing things and having more people doing it. Hello, microphone. So we thought Twitter is a collaborative space. So yeah, the, the, this was like the next stage where we decided to have the users, like the players actually design the content and then generate it on the fly in the game. So you got a whole load of tweets here that generate the room. So if we look at the very top left uh, by actual Pokesley, um, they've made a dungeon room. It's a normal room as denoted by the normal. And then there's a load of string of characters and numbers. And what that does is those numbers represent where in a room it would spawn, and then the characters are what it would spawn. Um, I can't even remember what C is right now. Uh, C is clutter, so, so that would be like a, a, a rock or something, probably. I'm not really sure. So this way we were using Twitter to generate all the content on the fly, but we allowed the players to have an input in what was generating, and it was meaningful rather than just random stuff being chucked together. Yeah, we could have used just using like Unicode values and messing around with it and just having like a great big messy, like string being sent out, but we decided we'd actually make it so you, if you played the game for a while, you'd be able to actually identify stuff that's going on. So, oh yeah, big B is a bat or something like that, and you know what was going on. So what it looks like now is that kind of thing. So we've actually now realized, a lot of people are saying, you can't fit a dungeon into 140 characters. That won't work. That's just silly. There's no point. Um, and then we realized we actually have a lot more characters left over half the time. So we've actually increased the um, string length. So for example, where we've got Earth M and Water M and Dark, we've now got it so there are Earth Mages, Water Mages, and you can actually control the lighting in the room via that sort of dark command, so you can change things like that. So we just kept adding and adding and adding, and feature creep happened, and stuff like that. Eventually, the game's going to get released on Steam, eventually. So, first of all, I love, like, the best bit of making presentations is Googling, like, those stock images of, like, people having fun and children learning. And this one appealed to me because he looks like he's really learning there. Um, so we definitely did learn from using Twitter. 
uh, people really protective, uh, protective over their social media profiles, which is probably a given with hindsight. So while everyone got to make dungeons together and like everyone could see what everyone was making, some people didn't want to post at all. They didn't like the way the tweets would look and they felt it was a bit spammy. Uh, Twitter, really slow to update sometimes if you're not using the live stream, which we didn't want to do. Um, so sometimes people would go, why the fuck is my dungeon not spawning? And they get really angry at us, even though it was Twitter's fault. Uh, we had a thing where essentially uh, our server grabs the tweets every 15 seconds because of the way the way Twitter works is you can only get tweets every certain amount. You've got like a limit on how many times you can actually get tweets. So our server pings Twitter every 15 seconds, gets all the tweets and then passes them rather than have it as the clients doing it because we started with that and it took like an absolute age for any like the clients to get any information. So getting our server to do all the heavy lifting allowed us to actually get the tweets in quicker and get things running so people wouldn't have to sit for a minute waiting for all the dungeons to load, which was a bit of a pain. So yeah, also not ideal really for PCG is what I'd say the, the main takeaway message from that game was. Because, you know, I think actually after the talk that we just saw, maybe using the strings to actually like generate stuff on the fly, like completely random would be more interesting now, but I don't know, mm -hmm. something to think about. Uh, the, the main benefit of using Twitter, the game's promoted constantly when people play, which, yeah, we liked. At one point, um, Hash the Dungeon was trending, which was kind of cool, because we had a lot of people tweeting about it at the same time. Uh, this is the next thing to talk about. I'll grab these now. So um, has anyone seen this before? Hands up if you've seen this. Yeah? So what is this? It's like something called Hat Note, Listen to Wikipedia. So what this does is it generates some sort of, it generates like a nice musical piece based on edits from Wikipedia. And I thought it was quite nice. So I thought, could we make this into a game? Could we take that data stream and turn it and make it into a procedure generated game from that data stream? So we created something called the Utopian Project. Um, and the idea was uh, it was set in this sort of like futuristic world, like sort of cyberspace, and you had to protect, protect like an AI that was uploading data from Wikipedia. But if someone hacked or, gen or like did a malicious edit on Wikipedia, it would cause a, an infected node to appear, and that would try and infect the AI. Um, on Wikipedia, the average amount of edits per minute is about 87. It's quite impressive how much, like how many edits there are on Wikipedia. Ooh. I think I just blew everything up. No, you just oh, there we go. It's, it's fine. fine. Okay, that's all right. It's cool. <laughs> uh, so we developed this with a programmer, Alex Say. Uh, he's Abengoshis on Twitter. He doesn't tweet much, and when he does, it generally tends to be very grumpy, so I wouldn't follow him. Um, and this is what it looked like. Um, so it was a top-down shooter. Uh, over at the top there, you can see a edit which basically someone's taken uh, some article about the beauty of Kent. I don't know. And they've deleted it, and it's a, a, clearly a malicious edit, because the way we worked out when, whether something was a malicious edit or not was because um, Wikipedia has some bots that look at malicious edits, and they instantly change them back about a couple of seconds later. So whenever an edit happened, we'd have a listener waiting for another change. So if that change was almost instant, we assumed that it was a malicious edit because it was being reverted by the bots. Uh, down at the bottom, there's a couple of little, like, what's that one? Island House? There's some weird stuff on Wikipedia. There's some really weird things. And the other one is David McSweeney Disambiguation. What? Why? That's weird. So um, essentially, the game was generated from these things, uh, but there were problems, major problems with using Wikipedia. So these are some statistics that we took. Um, about the amount of times there is an edit, we did edits per minute, and we, did, we ran it for a bit, about a day and saw how it was working. Um, if you notice, uh, most of them come from the United States, most, uh, so there's some from the United Kingdom, and there's in, India did a lot that was very strange, and so, was, so did Canada. Um, there's a massive like, peak during the day. It tends to be after school. Um, I assume it's because there's a bunch of like kids coming around and just deleting loads of things and edit things on Wikipedia. So during the day, uh, the game was kind of crap because hardly anything happened. But as soon as school finished, the game got quite exciting. Um, and that was the problem with this game because it was only fun to play during certain times of the day. The rest of the day, it was kind of crap. And you'd just sit in there for ages going, why are there no edits? Why is nothing happening? And the problem was with that, we didn't want to sort of like tweak things and add things in to just sort of like tweak the gameplay. We wanted it to be just the pure data stream from Wikipedia. So it kind of got really boring at certain times of the day. Well, like it ran into the same problems that Hashtag Dungeon did in that when you just pull in this like kind of random data in, 
and not doing anything interesting with it, it gets boring. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it tended to be when students were getting home from school, little brats. Uh, other stuff that we've tried. Um, we created a game uh, where we fired an arrow around the world. A couple of weeks ago, it was International Robin Hood Day. That's a thing, apparently. <laughs> Um, and we looked at Twitter data based on the hashtag Robin Hood Day. And the more tweets there were, the, basically we had this arrow, this giant arrow, and we were going to launch it around the world. And every five minutes, uh, the, the arrow fires, and it goes up in a nice bezier curve, and, da -da 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 -da, and it lands, and it, and it goes, and either it lands on the ground or it lands in the water. And the more tweets there were, the further the arrow got propelled. And it was a really nice sort of like social experience. We had people sitting there on the Twitch stream sort of like going, come on, come on, come on, hit the arrow, make sure it gets to the end. And lots of people were like telling other people to tweet and it got really, really sort of crazy and snowballed as the day went on. So towards the end, the arrow was flying much further. Like to, be to begin with, it was going up and then it was landing directly back in Sherwood. And then by the end of the day, it was going all the way around the world past, like it took a very long time to get past uh, Russia. Russia was quite the sticking point, so it was just sort of jumping and just landing in the same place, but eventually it got round. It was good. Um, this is a bee. Bees are an integrated species. Uh, they are very, very useful. Um, I'm going to talk about bees for a minute now. If, ever, if any of you follow me on Twitter, you'll know that I talk about bees a lot. Um, they're cool because unlike other insects, uh, where um, everything dies out except for the queen, and the queen has to repopulate during the spring, uh, bees cluster together and then they stay alive over the winter. Uh, so what we did was we wanted to make a game that used real-time weather data to create like a sort of like bee hive simulator. So you go out as a bee and you have to go and collect stuff. So when it's raining during the outside, it's raining in the game. When it's snowing outside, it's snowing in the game. And the the game gets harder when it's snowing. So it gives people an appreciation for the hardships that bees have, especially during the winter months when they're occasionally we'll go out, they'll go out and forage, but for the most part, they'll stay in the hive. Um, and it was interesting, uh, but the problem was uh, we were living in Lincoln and uh, it, it would, like winter had passed, so when we were trying to test the game, it was pretty much always summer, uh, and so it was difficult to test. I mean, you could, you could fake the weather, but it wasn't as interesting as actually playing the game. And we wanted to see over a long period of time uh, whether or not people would play a lot in the summer, then drop off during the winter, then play a lot during the summer, kind of like how bees actually work. Uh, and then we, played, we made this game called uh, Natural Election. Uh, and Natural Election um, was a bunch of white old men in the Houses of Parliament beating the crap out of one another. Um, <laughs> And that was for the general election. Uh, we made it in about four days. I think it was four days. Um, yeah, so basically, that was my understanding of how the election system works in this country. I presume they, they literally just went and shouted and fought each other. Um, I'm pretty sure that is what happens, right? Yeah, I've seen Prime Minister's questions a couple of times, and it seems to be like that. Um, so yeah, we like, knocked this up in a couple of days um, and ended up streaming it live at the National Video Game Arcade in Nottingham again. Um, and what happened, so we were using data from Twitter, so we'd analyze like strings to see if they were trying to support like um, UKIP or Tories, et cetera. Yeah, the way we did that, we looked at um, sentiment analysis on the tweets. So if someone was saying, oh, screw UKIP, then they'd be like, oh, that's a negative. So we'd lower their score for that round. And then um, if it was like pro-conservative, I don't know why you'd be, but if it was pro-Tory or pro-Labor, then we'd add to their score. And then after a bit, about a minute, we'd generate a room full of 100 MPs uh, based on the uh, percentages of who was supporting who. And then they'd all run into the center and they'd smack each other around until only one person let, was left standing. And at that point, they'd get a point. And that point would be displayed on the side of the thing. And some cool stuff came out of it. So yeah, I think like what was kind of surprising is we accurately predicted the election results before anyone else. <laughs> Um, it was good. No, that, that shouldn't have happened, because while we were, like, you know, uh, pulling in the tweet stuff, the actual combat was completely randomized, like, so it had no bearing, but... Lo and behold, we predicted the Conservatives were going to win. Um, the only thing that was different it was, bec was the Green Party, and I think that's because Twitter tends to be more sort of liberal than uh, Conservative, so um, I think the Green Party got a lot more support from people who use Twitter. Um, but for the rest of them, 
it was reasonably accurate, except for the Scottish National Party. But I don't think anyone was predicting that. But all we know is the Conservatives won overall. Uh, so yeah, we're going to use it for the American election next year. Only I think we're going to have a bunch of donkeys. So the, the Americans have some weird animals for their uh, what? That's it's donkey and a donkey and an elephant. So we're going to have a bunch of elephants and a bunch of donkeys and have them just beat the shit out of one another. Yeah. It'll be great. Yeah, the same game, at least. The same game, but with cute elephants and donkeys. Uh, so what we're working on now? This is where everyone in the room is going to laugh. Uh, we're going to finish hashtag dungeon eventually. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> uh, so Kieran put in multiplayer. Yeah, like, what, two months ago? I was like, Sean, online co-op is where it's going to be. And I was like, no. And I did it anyway. Like, that's just the way it works. Uh, and it's not even close to being finished. <laughs> and we're both sick of that project, but we need to We're going to get it done, and it's going to get on Steam, and it's going to be fine, and then we're going to wash our hands of it, and it'll be, be great. Um, and then we're working on something new. So uh, we've had this idea in the works for a while. Uh, it's a little bit edgy as it's well. It's very edgy, yeah. yeah uh, so prepare yourself for this. Uh, we're working on it for something new, and uh, I was like, what other sources of data are there that we haven't tapped into yet? We've done weather. We've done, I mean, we, I haven't, we haven't done stock markets. That might be something cool to do. But uh, we haven't done weather, and we haven't done... No, we've done weather, and we've done a bunch of other stuff, and we've done Twitter to death. So what other things are there? And uh, there was another API that I came across. And I was like... How'd you come across it? Oh, <laughs> um, uh, well, uh, I was like, what about, what about, uh, what about RedTube? What about, what about that? Because that's got, that's got an API for some reason. There's an API for RedTube. They've got, they've got a data stream, apparently. And you can use it. So why not? Why not RedTube? Uh, so uh, I asked Kieran, can we uh, make a game that uh, uses uh, porn data? And he gave, and I was like, I can't think of any reasons why we, we can't do this. We should be able to do this. And he gave me a list of 50 things why we shouldn't do it. But we're doing it anyway because he's doing multiplayer and hashtag dungeon, so I'm going to do this. Um, and then we started work on it. We started on something called Lust, and we created this scraper that got all the data. Uh, and those are some <laughs> of the uh, wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, different things you can get on there. Um, so you can get all of the detailed stars, you can find out what videos are going on, you can search videos, you can get all that information, blah, 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 blah. It's surprisingly comprehensive. Surprisingly comprehensive. Um, uh, but then we decided, why limit ourselves to just porn? Why? Why do that? So uh, we sort of changed the game up a little bit. We, we, we felt that we were sort of like just like shoehorning ourselves in, and this, this real-time data wasn't particularly really working very well. So we thought, why not procedurally generate every single circle of hell? Because uh, using RedTube was interesting, but we can do so much better. So we looked at Dante's The Inferno, uh, and we looked at a bunch of the other like, novellas and information about hell. Uh, and we thought, why, why just lust? So why not do all the circles of hell? Why limit ourselves to the whims of an adult entertainment site? So we created a game. We're working on a game now called Satan's Hole. Uh, the name was come up with, so we're currently working with the uh, sound designer for Nuclear Throne, so he's doing the sound and the, uh, the, the music for it, and it's, uh, we've got some music already, and it's, it's pretty intense, it's like uh, black metal, it's really nice. Um, and uh, he decided to call it Satan's Hole. We were going to call it something else, but he was like, Satan's Hole sounds yeah, good. Yeah, it kind of just came out like on a whim, he went, well, that's Satan's Hole, and there was no way we couldn't. I was Use like, yeah, that that's, that's, that's going to be perfect. I can imagine like, the headlines on like, Polygon and stuff. Dare you delve into Satan's hole and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, we're working on this procedurally generated uh, sort of like Quake-style uh, shooter now where we're generating all the maps and stuff and, and, and generating like, towers and, and enemies and stuff like that. So that's our new project, and it's going to be quite fun, I think. So there'll be more on that eventually. So in conclusion, uh, working with real-time data is, is fun, and it's a challenge. But as you might have seen, like, the general theme is it's, it, it's really kind of boring. Like, we haven't found any, any interesting gameplay that can emerge from like, just using real-time data, which is why we kind of went a different way of Hashtag Dungeon. I mean, it's a bit, it's a little, it's, it's gimmicky. It's very gimmicky. Um, but it was, it, was, it was interesting to like, experiment with and try things out, because even if it didn't work, it means that we've done it, and we can say, yeah, it didn't really work that very well, or if it did, especially with the Wikipedia one, it works at, like, between the times of like, 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock at night. So it works reasonably well at that time. 
Uh, and another problem with using like real-time data is you always need internet access all the time, which is a shame, especially with, uh, with hashtag dungeon, we've actually had to put in like a standalone offline, just procedural generation like model because uh, it wasn't fun. For, I, I wanted to play out on the train, so it wasn't fun to just sort of say, well, you can't play it unless you've got an internet connection. Um, and the other one is that uh, it's way more random than your standard random generator because it's it's literally like real real time random data that's coming in. Like Twitter is a constant steady stream of unfiltered hate hates no tw <laughs> tweets. So uh, it's it, it's it's interesting from that point of view. Any questions, guys? That's that's the talk. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Go on. Brave soul. <laughs> uh, we don't. <laughs> yep. Um, we, 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 in, in hashtag dungeon, one of the things that you can do is you can leave like Dark Souls style messages using tweets. And um, what we're going to do is just putting in a sort of general swear filter for that. Um, but other than that, we so don't. I think it's it's kind of important to allow that stuff to some extent because it, it it's the players expressing their creativity. So if they are on a right, you know, you're a fucking asshole on the floor of a dungeon, then they should be allowed to. Like I'm not too fussed. I'm slightly um, more fussed than Kieran is, but you know, it's fine. He'll ignore it. It's fine. Yeah. Any other questions? How how did they um, react to all of that? Well, so I actually think. That's a really good idea. Like, I'd love to see the election results with like uh, their red tube habits, and kind of see how that ties in with each state. Yeah, yeah. I vaguely remember you mentioning your video rental talk, which is how you came across it. There was something, there was something that you related, which I think mixed. That was oh, it was weather and GPS data. So mm -hmm. we used the GPS data to mix, it so we we could find out where the person was to be able to actually tell where the weather was, because otherwise it could, if we were taking just the GPS data from Lincoln, someone in Australia would be like, why is it snowing? That makes no sense, it's not snowing outside. So yeah, we, took, we use GPS data there as well. Um, and other games that like we know people have worked on, we've, uh, someone did, um, they used aircraft locations, uh, and when an aircraft was above you, uh, it would alert you to the fact that there was an aircraft above you and it was going to crash land on you. So you have to run out of the, run out of the area. So it was using GPS locations and also uh, like real-time air, air, air flight control data, which was fun. Yeah, it was, it was tiring. You should uh, go check out Hashtag Dungeon. The way that it spreads content around via tweets is good. Did you have a question? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just really interesting to see your observations about the variety of sources that you use. It seems like there's a... Yes. Yeah. If we use it as a random seed, yeah, that could be a lot, it could create a whole lot more gameplay. But we wanted to try and stay as close to the the, the actual source of the information because otherwise there was no point in using the information in the first place, really. Yeah. We, it, yeah. Yeah. Originally, it, it it turned more as as we got as we worked it on, it became more and more like user generated than procedural generated. But yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you very much. No problem. Probably. Uh, no problem. Uh, thank you very much. No problem.